Tonight, we're going to talk about the Great War for Civilization. That's what my grandfather John Ferguson's victory medal called the First World War. He earned it as a teenager in the Ypres salient, serving as a private in the Seaforth Highlanders. Now, John Ferguson was one of the lucky ones who came back more or less in one piece. One in four Scottish soldiers didn't return. The First World War was Britain's deadliest war. It killed two and a half times more servicemen than the Second World War. And I suppose it was trying to understand this national catastrophe that first got me interested in history. After a hundred years of research and debate, there are still those who lay the blame for the war on dastardly German plans for world domination and lament the end of a golden era of peace and prosperity. But I'm going to show you the British government bore a heavy share of the responsibility for turning an act of state-sponsored terrorism in the Balkans into a global bloodbath. I also want to persuade you that considering the horrendous consequences of the First World War, Britain's decision for war was a disaster not just for this country, but also for the entire world. Now, to debate the causes, course, and consequences of the First World War, I'm joined by a distinguished panel of experts and an audience that includes students of the war. First, I'm going to make my case that the war was a horrendous mistake, and then we're going to have what I can guarantee will be a very lively debate. Now, to understand the full disastrous significance of the First World War, you need to appreciate that before 1914, the world had been moving in quite a good direction. That only becomes clear, however, when you put the war in a long-term perspective. At the beginning of human history, life was unspeakably violent. An astonishing one in six skulls exhumed in Scandinavia from the late Stone Age had nasty head injuries like this. As the 17th century British philosopher Thomas Hobbes famously remarked, life before civilization was solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So much of human history is the history of violence. Even the most ancient civilizations were astonishingly bloodthirsty. In medieval Europe, as in ancient Rome, torture was routine. Criminals were hanged or at least mutilated, and heretics, religious dissidents, were burnt at the stake or broken on a wheel. War was frequent, at times even incessant. The Crusaders killed up to a million Muslims and Jews. The Spanish Inquisition claimed another 350,000 lives. The English fought the French for a hundred years when they weren't fighting the Scots, the Irish, and one another. Even the 17th century, the era of the scientific revolution, saw the Thirty Years' War, which killed at least three million people. Yet the long-run tendency was for violence to diminish. There was the most amazing decline in the European murder rate beginning in around the 14th or 15th centuries as the multiple feudal territories were consolidated into just a few kingdoms. Then, in the 18th century, men grew still less violent, the Enlightenment teaching them to empathize with one another, to imagine themselves as the victims of violence. True, men were murdering one another less, but they were still engaging in the most organized form of violence, namely war. Britain was at war for all but 12 years of the 18th century. The American War of Independence, for example, or the French Revolutionary Wars. Nevertheless, the Duke of Wellington's decisive victory over Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo appeared to usher in a new era. Aside from the Crimean War, Britain fought no European war for a century. Of course, there were plenty of colonial conflicts and wars of unification, not to mention the American Civil War. 
Still, by the late 19th century, contemporaries felt that the trend was away from conflict and towards commerce. Inventions like Marconi's wireless were integrating the world economy as never before. And this first age of globalization seemed to imply a new era of peace based on economic self-interest. Liberals like Norman Angel argued that war was now inconceivable because even the victors stood to lose more than they could possibly gain. It was a view later satirized by the playwright J.B. Priestley in an inspector calls. War? Fiddlesticks. The Germans don't want war. Nobody wants war. There's too much at stake these days. And just in case the audience missed the irony, Priestley has the same character say, the Titanic? Unsinkable. Absolutely unsinkable. In 1914, it was peace that hit an iceberg. Hopes that war had become a great illusion were shattered by four and a quarter years of global war. A staggering 65 million people from around 20 different countries were mobilized to fight. There were around 10 million military deaths and about the same number of premature civilian fatalities. The technologies that had made possible the Industrial Revolution and the first age of globalization were now harnessed to the work of destruction, of industrialized slaughter. This wasn't war as the European powers had known us in the past. It was far more destructive than any previous conflict. Armies were bigger, weapons more powerful. This war, to say nothing of the even larger conflict that contemporaries began to anticipate, the moment they started talking about a First World War, shattered the hope that the human race was getting steadily more peace-loving. The First World War killed more than 10% of all men aged between 15 and 49 in at least seven countries, including my own, Scotland. Moreover, the war ended with a lethal influenza pandemic, which spread as massive armies moved across oceans and continents. The flu alone killed an estimated 40 million people. Between 1914 and 1918, it seemed as if the civilizing process had come to an abrupt halt. And even gone into reverse. But how? And why? So, what caused this huge historical U-turn that we call the First World War? We know, or we think we know, where and when it began. On June the 28th, everyone I think knows this, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand visited the town of Sarajevo in Bosnia. Bosnia is a... That was my hero, the great A.G.P. Taylor, lecturing about the causes of the First World War here on the BBC nearly 40 years ago. That lecture's a wonderful example of the way my profession works. Not long after any big crisis happens, the historians arrive on the scene, ready to piece together retrospectively the chain of causation that led to disaster, tracing the origins of the First World War back from the assassination of the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, to the Austrian annexation of Bosnia, and then back even further to whatever it was that caused that. Actually, 
Most people were completely blindsided by the war when it broke out. Probably the best informed people in the world, who were the bankers of the City of London, were paying much more attention to the danger of a civil war in Ireland. So how could a single assassination have such world-shaking consequences? After all, assassinations were pretty regular occurrences in those days. Why did the great powers of Europe line up in the way that they did with Britain, France and Russia on one side and Germany, Austria and Turkey on the other? Because of alliances to which they'd all committed themselves? Because of the logic of their generals' war plans? Because of militarism, imperialism, nationalism or some other ism? Or was it just that one of the great powers, the German Reich, seized the pretext provided by yet another Balkan crisis to launch a war of conquest? In recent years, German, the younger generation of German historians have come more and more uh, to the belief that the imperial German government was actually a driving force for war and that the war of uh, which broke out in August 1914 far from being a war of accident was a war of design as one of them said long prepared for well the German historians led by Fritz Fischer argued that there was indeed a German bid for continental if not world domination dating back to 1912 if not earlier Elsewhere, Taylor argued that an arms race, and in particular the war plans of the great powers, created a kind of unstoppable war by timetable. But once again, it was the German plan, the Schlieffen plan, that bore the brunt of the blame. And yet there really is no iron law of history stating that all arms races must end in war. After all, the Cold War nuclear arms race didn't. And what about the three isms, imperialism, militarism, and nationalism? A pretty important part of the case against Germany is the idea that these isms were somehow more widespread in Germany than elsewhere. But were they? <laughs> All Quiet on the Western Front is the most famous anti-war book and film of all time. It won the Oscar for Best Picture in 1931. The elderly teacher, Professor Kantorak, personifies pre-war nationalism and militarism. It's Kantorak's jingoistic ranting that inspires his pupils to flock to enlist. But now, our country calls. The fatherland needs leaders. Personal ambition must be thrown aside in the one great sacrifice for our country. I'll go. I want to go. Count on me. But just how representative was Kantorak of German public opinion? This is still our perception of Germany in the years leading up to the war. An ultra-militarist society hell-bent on conflict. But contrary to popular belief, Germany wasn't the most militarized nation in Europe in 1914. France was. In fact, the very term militarism is French in origin. France spent a higher proportion of its gross domestic product on defense than Germany and imposed peacetime military service on a higher proportion of its young men. In fact, it was Germany that had the strongest anti-militarism in Europe. In 1912, the Social Democrats became the largest party in the German parliament on an anti-war ticket. Indeed, in a whole range of ways, Germany in 1914 was among the most progressive countries in the world. This is Berlin's Boulevard. You will find everything here. Palaces, a university, opera, royal guards, arsenal, museums, a government palace. 
Germany had the biggest and most innovative economy in Europe. And unlike in Britain, in Germany every adult male had the right to vote. Enthusiasm for war was far from unique to Germany. In Britain we have in our mind's eye images of wildly celebrating crowds in the streets and young men flocking to the colours. That was certainly what my grandfather did at the age of just 16. But just how widespread was such popular enthusiasm for war in 1914? In truth, for most people the prospect of war was cause not for jubilation, but for trepidation. As war broke out, the British Foreign Secretary Sir Edward Grey stood at a window in the Foreign Office, watching the lamps being lit as dusk approached, and famously remarked, The lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our time. Less well known, however, is the pessimism of the Germans. Nine years before the war, the chief of the great general staff, Helmut von Moltke, had already warned the Kaiser that the war would turn into a long and tedious struggle with a country that will not give up before the strength of its entire people has been broken. The archival evidence actually makes it clear that the Germans were not bidding for world power. Rather, their main motivation for going to war was a sense of weakness, particularly with regard to the rapidly growing economic and military strength of Russia. And that's the most striking feature of the crisis to me. Almost every one of the major powers acted out of a sense of weakness rather than strength. Most of the dramatic phenomena that we historians study, not only wars, but also revolutions and other big crises, are not the climaxes of protracted, deterministic storylines. Instead, they represent the often sudden breakdowns of complex systems. To see what I mean, take a look at these paintings, which are my favourites in the New York Historical Society's collection. They're called The Course of Empire, and were painted by the American artist Thomas Cole between 1833 and 1836. The world is transformed from the lush wilderness of the savage state to the agrarian idyll of the pastoral state. To the opulent citizen consumers of the consummation of empire, in destruction, the survivors flee the invading hordes. Finally, the moon rises over the fifth painting. Desolation. There's not a living soul to be seen. For centuries, historians thought about the past in these terms, as a series of gradual, cyclical ups and downs, as one empire waxed, another waned. But such historical cycles are much easier to see through the rearview mirror. At the time, they're less visible. So let's ask ourselves, what if collapse comes suddenly, like a thief in the night? What if that's what happened to the international system in the summer of 1914? The world in 1914 was dominated by the great European empires, which controlled close to half its land surface and population, and an even larger share of its economy. 
At their hearts were big industrial and commercial capital cities like London, Paris, Berlin, Vienna, and St. Petersburg. Yet thanks to new communication technologies, these cities were able to rule over vast areas as not only orders but also capital, people and ideas were relayed around the world. By 1914, this international imperial order was a truly complex system characterized by very high levels of interdependence. The problem is that at a certain crucial moment, even a small shock to such a system can produce huge, often unanticipated changes. The weak points of this complex system were where the empires met. These were the nodes where a relatively small perturbation could spread a shock right the way around the world. In 1914, there were two nodal points that mattered. The first was the Balkans, where the retreat of the Ottoman Empire had created opportunities for Austria-Hungary and Russia to exert their influence over the weak nation-states of Serbia, Romania and Bulgaria. The other nodal point was Belgium, the artificial half-French, half-Dutch buffer state set up after the Napoleonic Wars to impose some barrier on France's northward expansion. Now the important thing about Belgium was that its neutrality in a war was guaranteed by a treaty signed by all the great powers in 1839. So, the assassination in Sarajevo was the butterfly that flaps its wings in the Amazonian rainforest and causes a hurricane on the other side of the world. From the point of view of the Austrians, this was an act of state-sponsored terrorism. They clearly had to do much more than just ask the Serbs to cooperate in a murder inquiry. From the Russian point of view, ten years after humiliation by the Japanese, this was a chance to man up, so they stood shoulder to shoulder with their Slavic brothers in Belgrade. Now the Germans did not really care that much about the Balkans, but they saw here an opportunity to check Russia's massive arms build-up, which by 1914 wasn't yet complete. A German war with Russia implied a German war with France. Why? Because A, there was an alliance between the French and the Russians, and B, there was a German war plan, the Schlieffen Plan, that required the Germans to knock out the French in order to stand a chance of beating the Russians. What's more, that German plan also implied the violation of Belgian neutrality. Why? Because the German generals calculated that they could only knock out France if they sent a part of their force to the north and west of Paris, rather than across the heavily fortified Franco-German border. All of this was more or less a predictable consequence, a chain reaction from the catalyst in Sarajevo. Indeed, maybe the surprising thing was that the war hadn't happened before. There was just one unknown quantity, and that was the biggest empire of them all, Britain. What made the First World War a world war, and a four-year one at that, was the British decision to intervene, ostensibly to uphold the neutrality of Belgium, in reality to avert a German defeat of France. And contrary to what you may have been taught at school, this British intervention was far from inevitable. August 1914. In Whitehall, ministers weigh the pros and cons of intervention in the war. The 2nd of August 1914 was a rather stuffy, thundery Sunday, and all the members of the cabinet would much rather have been down in the country. The Foreign Secretary, Sir Edward Grey, was a keen fly fisherman. He would rather have been casting for trout. The Prime Minister, Herbert Asquith, 
would have preferred to be sipping gin with his mistress, Venetia Stanley. Both men knew that Grey had privately committed Britain to support France in the event of a continental war, but there was no formal alliance. They had not been able to commit the cabinet or parliament to the policy. The only person in the room who was truly happy was the First Lord of the Admiralty. But then Winston Churchill openly admitted to loving war. The anti-war elements in the cabinet looked to the radical Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Welsh wizard David Lloyd George. They were convinced that he would speak up against British involvement in the unfolding Continental War. Britain's decision for war in 1914 was the result not of grand strategy, but of low politics. What kept Lloyd George silent and ensured that the rest of the cabinet lined up behind Grey, Asquith and Churchill was the realisation that if they didn't, the Hawks would resign, the government would fall and the Tories would be in. And the Tories were even more enthusiastic than Churchill for a war against Germany. If only those poor opponents of war sat round the cabinet table that day had been able to glimpse just a little of what lay in store for them, might they have acted differently? Well, we can't know for certain what might have happened if Britain had delayed intervening. Maybe the Germans would still have failed to break the French will to fight on. But I think the absence of a British expeditionary force would have been decisive. As in 1870, and as would happen again in 1940, even with British support, the French would have folded. After all, the opening six months of the war saw half a million Frenchmen permanently incapacitated, a shattering level of casualties. Without escalating British support, the war would have ended with a German victory in 1916, if not earlier. But then what? Well, the traditional answer to that question is that Britain would have suffered a disastrous loss of prestige and of power. Not only would perfidious Arbion have left the Belgians in the lurch, now a superpower Germany would be able to build naval bases on the Channel Coast. And yet there's absolutely no evidence from the period before the British intervention that the Germans intended to establish a long-term presence in Belgium. Left to their own devices, might they not have focused on defeating Russia, which was in fact their main objective? Now remember not to confuse the two world wars here. For example, Eastern Europe's Jews would have been much better off under the Kaiser than under the Tsar. And if the Kaiser's Germany had used victory on the European continent to annex Belgium, would that really have posed a fatal threat to the mighty British Empire, covering as it did quarter of the world, ruling not only the ways but also the international capital market. Britain would still have had the option to intervene when ready to do so. Could we not have bided our time to see how the continental contest turned out and to build up our land forces rather than throwing barely trained recruits at the German lines? And I reflect on all the young men whose lives were lost between 1914 and 1918, to say nothing of the horrendous cost of the war, I can't help feeling that the British cabinet made the biggest error in modern history on that sweltering summer Sunday. For British intervention in 1914 didn't just change the course and outcome of the war, it also changed the way the war was fought. <laughs> intervention turned a continental war into a world war, which the European nations could wage only by mobilizing all their resources, including manpower and materials from their empires outside Europe. The result was bloodshed on an unprecedented scale. But what's often forgotten is that your chance of being killed depended a great deal on where you came from. <laughs> <laughs>
In absolute numbers, the French, the Germans, the Russians, and the Austro-Hungarians lost by far the most men in the war. But if you put the figures in percentage terms, a very different picture emerges. Take the case of Britain and Ireland. Something like 6% of men aged between 15 and 49 lost their lives during the war. But that was by no means the highest percentage. In the case of France and Germany, the figure was above 12%. The same, by the way, goes for Scotland. But for Romania, it was 13%, and for the Ottoman Empire, 15%. And yet, by far the largest casualties in relative terms were suffered by Serbia, where around 23% of military-age men lost their lives. The contrast couldn't be more extreme between Serbia on the one side and the United States at the other end, where just 0.4% of military-age men were killed. This was a world war all right, but where you came from significantly influenced your chances of surviving it. British intervention also ensured a step change in the way the war was conducted. It wasn't the tank, much less mustard gas, that inflicted most of the war's casualties. The technological innovations of this war were in fact far fewer than those of the Second World War. Beyond the railheads, horses still hold the supplies. Men still fix bayonets. The real change was in this. the poet Siegfried Sassoon's electrifying repressions of war experience, written while he was convalescing in Kent, where the guns of the Western Front were still audible. And you've just experienced the sight and sound of 20 seconds of artillery shell fire. On the 21st of February 1916, before the Battle of Verdun, the Germans fired 100,000 shells from 1,400 guns every hour for 10 hours along an eight-mile front. The Germans called it Trommelfeuer, drumfire. The overwhelming majority of casualties in the First World War were caused by such storms of steel and explosives. Never before in all of military history had so much firepower been unleashed. And this was because of the way Britain's intervention had turned what might have been a relatively short and mobile war into a protracted war of attrition. At the beginning of the war in August 1914, French infantry, conspicuous in their traditional blue coats and red trousers, advanced through the Ardennes forest. Who could have designed a better target for the German machine gunners? In just one day, 27,000 Frenchmen died. But with the British Expeditionary Force helping to halt the German advance at the Battle of the Marne in September 1914, the war soon mutated from this into this. What distinguished the Western Front from the other theatres of war 
of the scale of the trenches and fortifications set up to protect troops from lethal hails of machine gun bullets and shells. The repeated efforts by both sides to launch frontal attacks seem like madness to us today. Perhaps that's why so much of the literature inspired by the war has focused on the psychological traumas it caused. Most famously, shell shock, the mental damage inflicted by artillery bombardments. Yet the truly remarkable thing about the First World War is that despite the terrible conditions, only a tiny minority of men suffered mental breakdowns, or for that matter, deserted. The reality is that most men coped with the hardship and the danger. Why was that? Well, it seems that the threat of being shot at dawn wasn't crucial. Because they were so static, the armies of the Western Front could build the infrastructure to give the frontline soldiers the things they needed to make war bearable. Regular leave, tolerably dry accommodation, alcohol, tobacco, hot food, entertainment and even sex, thanks to the French system of Maison Tolérée. Yet that is a necessary but not sufficient explanation for why the First World War just kept on going. Another reason was the growth of mutual animosity, even hatred. Men who lost comrades to enemy snipers or shells were seldom forgiving. We just looked on you as vomit, one Tommy told a cowering group of German prisoners. And this may be the key to understanding why the First World War broke the trend of declining violence in the Western world. This new kind of industrialized warfare seemed to strip away much of the hard-won civilization of the previous centuries and to expose the fundamentally violent nature of the male of the species. Most of us regard ourselves as upstanding members of society who don't harbour violent thoughts towards our fellow citizens. So the findings of Harvard psychologist Steven Pinker may surprise you. The vast majority of us are never going to commit an act of violence in our entire lifetimes. However, uh, a large number of us harbour fantasies of uh, committing violence. If you just do surveys of even university students and ask them, have you ever fantasized about killing someone that you don't like, a majority of them will confess that they have. And often people will buy out in their minds how they will cut or shoot or strangle or torture in theatrical detail their former uh, tormentor or enemy. So what happens when these demons are taken to war? In modern wars, what often happens is that the nation-state gets defined psychologically as the, uh, the in-group or the out-group. And we can project distrust, fear, prejudice against the uh, enemy coalition. It's easy to demonize the other side if the other side commits a harm against you or your allies, then uh, it's natural to think that they are uh, less than human, that they are evil, and that sets the stage for a willingness to retaliate and a belief that, that it's just. Then if suddenly the opportunity presents itself where they outnumber a member of the enemy, then uh, it, uh, savagery just can burst forth. <laughs> 
The founder of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud, called it the death instinct. What Freud is saying there is that under particular kinds of uh, cultural and social conditions, quite suddenly, the mask slips, and what is revealed is the most primitive forms of cruelty, aggression, and hatred, which Freud is saying is part of what we are, and we pay a great cost by not recognizing it. Literally one week, people could be neighbors, going to the shops together, and virtually the following day, because of a sudden uh, imposition of an ethnic divide, they become other, and they become the hated enemy to be annihilated. So the First World War was a turning point, not only in the history of war, but also in the history of the human condition. It seemed to shatter the illusion of human progress onward and upward, and to confirm the most pessimistic views of our nature. Ask yourself a simple question. Why, if the war was so appalling, did it keep going for so long? The answer is that men got very good indeed at killing one another. And yet, even as the death toll rose to dwarf all previous European wars, the weaker side stubbornly refused to give up. Once Britain had intervened, the so-called Entente powers, mainly Britain, France and Russia, had overwhelming superiority in financial resources and numbers of men relative to the central powers, Germany and Austria plus Turkey, which had come in on the German side in November 1914. In terms of population, the ratio of advantage was more than 5 to 1. In terms of economic output, nearly 4 to 1. The Entente Powers spent two and a half times as much on the war, and yet it dragged on for four and a quarter years. Why was that? One answer, as we've seen, is that industrialized slaughter was just much more tolerable than anyone before the war could possibly have imagined. But a better answer is that the Germans were able to compensate for their demographic and economic disadvantages by being better killers. If you judge military success by the philosopher Bertrand Russell's yardstick, maximum slaughter at minimum expense, Germany won the First World War. As you can see, in literally every month of the war, from August 1914 through until the summer of 1918, the Germans consistently killed or captured more British and French soldiers than they lost themselves. And the margin of superiority was even greater on the Eastern Front. To put it absolutely brutally, the Germans were more efficient. They killed 35% more than they lost. They captured 30% more than they lost. And what's more, they did it more cheaply. Here is a grotesque statistic. It cost the Germans roughly 2,300 pounds to kill an Allied soldier. It cost the British 7,500 pounds to kill a single German. So why were British soldiers less efficient killers? Well, the obvious answer is that for most of the war, they and the French had to take the offensive to dislodge the Germans from their heavily fortified positions in Belgium and northern France. But the Germans were also the leaders when it came to tactical innovation. It was they who pioneered the lethal creeping artillery barrage and the system of defensive depth. For these reasons, despite their economic disadvantages, the Central Powers had a serious chance of winning the war. By late 1917, a savvy investor might even have been tempted to bet on a German victory, or at the very least on a stalemate in a negotiated settlement. By the spring of 1918, a German victory looked even more likely. After imposing a punitive treaty on, the Russia's, on Russia's new Bolshevik government, the Germans moved more than half a million soldiers to the Western Front for a massive offensive. 
For a time, the German army carried all before it, capturing and killing dazed British soldiers and driving deep into enemy territory. After years of stalemate, victory seemed to be within their reach. But no. Just a few months later, in August 1918, the German army suffered what its commander admitted was its greatest defeat since the beginning of the war. On October the 4th, Germany was forced to request an armistice. Many Germans reacted to their defeat with incredulity and anger. Among them was this man. Adolf Hitler. He's the one on the left who isn't smiling. Hitler, a messenger in the Bavarian army, was lying in a hospital bed recovering from a gas attack when the news of the German surrender came through. For Hitler, the only way to explain this extraordinary reversal of military fortunes was that the proud German soldier undefeated in the field, had been stabbed in the back by Jews and socialists at home. Let's see why he was wrong. One obvious answer to the question of why the Germans lost is that in 1917 the United States joined the side of the Entente Powers. And yet it's a mistake, I think, to imagine that the US decided the war. In reality, it was the British army that won the First World War, and it did so by finally beating the Germans at their own game, lethally combining infantry, artillery, armour and air power. As you can see, from July 1917 until June 1918, there were hardly any German surrenders. But then, beginning in July 1918, there was an explosive tenfold increase in the number of Germans laying down their arms. Now, the key to this collapse of German morale was the role their officers played. This wasn't a breakdown of discipline. Often, the German men laid down their arms at the order of their officers. So this was how the war ended. Not with Hitler's mythical stab in the back, but with a sickening recognition by what was left of the German officer class that the war simply couldn't be won. It turned out that the key to victory was not maximum slaughter at minimum expense. The key was to persuade one side to start surrendering. To win the First World War, the victors had paid a staggering price in blood and treasure, indeed a much higher price in absolute terms than was paid by Germany and her allies. We're left with just one question. Was it worth it? Imagine a country which has lost 22% of its territory, incurred debts equivalent to 135% of GDP, a fifth of it owed to foreign powers, where inflation and then unemployment have risen to levels not seen for more than a century. and which is in the grip of an unprecedented wave of strikes. Imagine a country in which the poverty of returning soldiers and their families contrasts grotesquely with the conspicuous consumption of a hedonistic and decadent elite. This was not only Germany in 1918, it was Britain too. For winners and losers alike ended the war exhausted, bereaved by their losses, weighed down by debt, demoralized by four years of deprivation. And for what exactly? At the beginning of this program, I, I said that the First World War was the great turning point of modern history. Well, now I hope you see why.
Not all its consequences were negative, to be sure. Autocrats fell from power, and for a time, it seemed that democracy would be the victor. Between 1914 and 1919, in more than 20 countries and six American states, women got the right to vote. Nevertheless, the war ended the illusion of a world steadily growing more peaceable and civilized. It transformed war in its scale and its nature. Itself born of a terrorist act, it brought forth chemical weapons. It vastly increased the power of the state in both economic and political life. And it also altered our very understanding of the human mind, laying bare its deepest and darkest destructive impulses. At a peace conference held in Paris, the winning empires tried to impose a new order on the losers with a series of treaties, most famously the one signed at Versailles. As was traditional, the victors took away land, reallocated colonies, and imposed indemnities known as reparations. But to imagine that the Germans could simply be kept weak by making them pay reparations was to dream. The war had been sold to the American public as the war to end all wars, and yet in the subsequent decades the violence was more or less unceasing. In the ruins of the Russian Empire, a civil war raged that claimed millions of lives. Meanwhile, in what was left of the Ottoman Empire, what had begun with the genocide of the Armenians continued with the ethnic cleansing of the Orthodox Greeks. In the Far East, in the Middle East, war raged on long after the guns of the Western Front had fallen silent. Part of the reason the violence continued was that the war created opportunities for abnormally violent individuals to come to power. Without four years of slaughter, it's very hard to believe that a psychopath like Stalin could ever have come to rule over Mother Russia. But for the First World War, Hitler might have ended his days as an obscure postcard painter in Munich. It took the war to create the two inhuman ideologies, Soviet Socialism in one country and German National Socialism. It's always illuminating to think about what we historians call the counterfactuals, the what-ifs of history. What if the British cabinet had decided not to intervene in 1914 and to leave the French and the Russians to fight the Germans on their own? Would there have been even one world war, never mind two? And what would Europe look like today if the Germans had indeed won that limited continental war? Well, perhaps the answer is just a little bit like this. A Europe dominated by the German economy. What's more, the German Chancellor's proposal for a European customs union, which was one of Germany's stated aims after the war had begun, was to a remarkable extent an anticipation of our own European Union. Except, of course, that our EU is the product of peaceful integration, not war. And Angela Merkel is a lot less scary than Kaiser Wilhelm II. Well, Britain's decision to enter the war of 1914 wasn't merely tragic for the hundreds of thousands of British men who lost their lives. I believe it was a catastrophic error without which the era of totalitarianism couldn't have come about. This isn't to denigrate the sacrifice of the men and boys who laid down their lives for their countries. It's merely to suggest that we need to learn the right lessons from history. My grandfather was told he'd fought for civilization. That's actually what it says here on his victory medal. Really? Perhaps a more honest inscription would have been that my granddad fought for the balance of power to prevent Germany from dominating the European continent. Was that ever going to be stopped by brute force of arms? Well, I've now said my piece. It's time to hear 
some other views. And we're extremely lucky to have with us tonight some of this country's leading experts on the First World War. Gary Sheffield, I'd like to go to you first, if I may. Was Britain right to intervene in August 1914, given how limited its land forces at that point were? I think Britain really had no alternative but to go into the war in 1914, because I must say I fundamentally disagree with your view of the essentially benign nature of a German, if a German victory had, had, had occurred. I think Britain went into war in 1914 for pretty well the same reason that it had fought a series of aggressive states in Europe, going back at least to the time of Elizabeth, including wars against Louis XIV of France, Napoleon, and of course later uh, against Hitler, and pretty well for the same reason that Britain joined NATO in 1949, to stop one um, continental power gaining hegemony over, over Europe. I can, see, I can buy that, okay. I can buy that. But if you think of just, just one of those parallels you just drew, the one with Napoleon, Britain didn't immediately send large land forces to the continent in the case of revolutionary France and Napoleonic France. We waited, and we didn't actually deploy a large army until 1809, relying up until that point on, on financial and, and, and also on, on naval power. Can I, can I go now to, to Hugh Strawn, if, I, if you'll forgive me, we'll come back to you, of course. Uh, Hugh, do you agree with Gary's point that Britain had no alternative? Would it really have been a catastrophe to have let the Germans win a limited continental war sometime after 1914? Why have you decided to call it a limited continental war? Well, tell me why uh, it would have been unlimited. Well, it, it seems to me a, a war between major powers within Europe is inherently unlimited. The ambition for a limited war is Austria-Hungary's ambition for a limited war in the Balkans. But the fact that the war has widened by the time, or the incipient war has widened by the time Britain enters it, does change the complexion radically. And I think you've got to also take on board Britain's imperial position. You present Britain as widening the war because it's an empire. I would argue very forcefully that Britain is trying to limit the war because it's an empire. Germany wishes to widen this war beyond Europe. Uh, the Kaiser makes that very clear himself at the end of July 1914, saying that at least if, if there is, is, is to be war, uh, then Britain must lose India. And it's, it's then Germ Britain's responsibility to try and narrow it, to try and contain it. Uh, it's exactly, Britain wants it to be a re European war, not a world war. Let me, let me go to David Reynolds now. David, you've thought a lot about these international historical questions. Was there an alternative strategy that Britain could have pursued that would have had a better outcome than the one that we saw? Well, the question, of course, is, is posed with hindsight, as you've said. It's the hindsight of, of knowing that death toll and the fact that a war went on for four years. In terms of the decision that the Cabinet finally made, it seems to me that it did make sense in terms of the traditions of British foreign policy. I agree with you that there are various traditions here. This is a power that is dealing with the continent, it's dealing with a global sense, and so on. But I do think that the issue for... Uh, the cabinet which held it together was not simply the question of uh, are we going to let the Tories in or not. Or not. Uh, you mentioned Lloyd George in your presentation. Lloyd George agonises over the question of whether to come into the war. In September he finally comes out publicly and says why he felt it was right that British, British should fight. Uh, obviously, the kind of speeches made in September have an element of propaganda about them, but they reflected Lloyd George's strong personal opinions. And he said, we are now fighting against what he called the road hog of Europe. The Prussian Juncker is the road hog of Europe. He's driving, as Lloyd George put it, little five foot five nations off the road, like Serbia, Belgium, and so on. Lloyd George had been a Welsh nationalist in the 1880s. He stood up for the Boers against the British in 19. Uh, in, the, uh, in 1899, but now he felt that the British were essentially right on the issue of uh, power politics, but also on the issue of morality. But David Stevenson, thinking about the imperial standpoint, did Britain have any alternative strategy in 1914 than to take what amounted to a huge risk to intervene in a land war for which it was in no way prepared? 
from the vantage point of, of 1918, it, it surely hadn't been very good for the British Empire. You're not making a moral or an ethical point. Of course one can look at these one million dead, the pictures that you've shown us. One can say, how on earth could that have been justified? What could possibly have been sufficient to, to, fade, to, to explain or to justify that level of sacrifice and suffering? But I don't think that's your starting point. Your starting point is a political point, that this was a mistake, that this was an error, that in other words, that choices existed and the bad choice was made. But what you miss here, I think, is the, well, is the fundamental problem, is your comparison of a possible scenario of Europe uh, settled on the basis of a German conquest and victory in 1915, as against the settlement that actually emerged in 1918. I think you're much too benign in your interpretation of what a Europe under German domination in 15 and 16 would have looked like. Your question it has to be whether a Europe based on German military power, domination, vassal states, which is the language used in German terminology and planning documents, is that really like the European Union that we have today? However much you may disagree or dislike certain features of it, I don't think it is. I don't think it was a stable basis. David, I noticed as you were talking, Heather Jones nodding when you said that a German victory would not have had such benign consequences. And that seemed a really crucial point. Uh, we're trying to imagine here a world that didn't happen, a world in which Britain doesn't intervene. Heather Jones, what do you think uh, a German victory would have looked like, especially one that had come much earlier than the ultimate end of the war in 1918? What we're looking at is really a very ruthless occupation of Belgium. Uh, the invasion itself has been very ruthless. We have 6,400 uh, Belgian and, and French civilians, women and children, quite young children, shot uh, by the invading German troops. Um, and the actual occupation which follows is also extremely ruthless. Civilians are deported to work in German war industries against their will. Civilians are, uh, women are deported from Lille to work in, 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 on, on the German war effort. This kind of Europe that you're envisaging that the Kaiser's Germany would have created uh, would have been something really quite uh, oppressive uh, in, in the East as well, in the Baltics, where we, we know that there's a very oppressive occupation as well. I mean, this is a Germany that goes to war where the parliament has no control over who is in government. Government is chosen by the Kaiser. Where by 1916 we have a military dictatorship headed by the generals Ludendorff and Hindenburg. Um, it's not a benign Germany. This was a very ruthless invasion from the start. It aimed at, at increasing German power. Germany wanted, Germany wanted to become an empire. And it saw France and, and Britain as having achieved that. Just before we go to the audience, I, I can't resist getting a German perspective on this. John Jungklausen, speak for Germany. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, yes. Well, I think what we tend to underestimate in, the, in, in this discussion quite easily is the importance of the economic growth of Germany after 1871. Germany, Germany's nationalism uh, was not least bolstered by this extraordinary economic growth that the, that the country experienced. The, uh, the growth was such that it spurred a kind of uh, nationalism on and, 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 and let, the, let the Kaiser uh, uh, ride ahead. But I think um, had it been uh, for, for a German victory early on, it would have been returned to, to a degree of economic sense, I think, a degree of, of uh, what makes sense to, 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 uh, to grow the economy further rather than to oppress uh, smaller countries. Well, th this is the moment uh, that I'm going to turn from the experts, I'll be back, uh, <laughs> to the audience. In 1914, the people who made the argument that I'm making were the people of the left. This might not have struck you yet, but the only people who strongly argued for non-intervention in 1914 were the far left of the Labour Party, and, and that indeed is one of the puzzles of the debate that we have these days about 1914. Almost nobody seems to want to make that left-wing case for non-intervention. Is there anybody here who buys the idea that Britain should have stayed out? Or are you all convinced by the majority of the, the panel that we did the right thing to intervene in, in 1914? There's a la lady there uh, in the nice Can red just... jacket. Can I just say, I think the problem with your broad brush and drawing the 
uh, relevance for today is you've actually done it with certain inaccuracies um, that our panel have pointed out. The first is the idea that if Britain hadn't gone in, it would have been a small-scale conflict, and that's been answered. The second is this preposterous, and you call it playful, um, idea that if Germany had imposed its customs union, um, it would have been like the EU. I mean, that, that I think is actually quite a damaging sort of argument and modern analogy to make. So, although I'm not against your counterfactual uh, ideas and your, your popular interpretations, I think you must do it with a, a level of, of accuracy, dare I say. Well, of course, there's a very big difference between speculation and, and fact, and we can none of us say factually what would have happened if Britain had not intervened. In that sense, it's not about accuracy, it's about interpretation. And as for the parallel with uh, the European Union, I said quite deliberately that that was playful, but it's designed to make us think. After all, are you telling me that Germany doesn't dominate the European no, Union? I think, actually, that to some I think it's actually rather irresponsible of you to be playful about, dare I say, a serious subject, you know? Um, why is, it, why is it irresponsible to ask a question about whether it was worth the United Kingdom fighting for four and a half years, sacrificing hundreds of thousands of lives, if the net result is not profoundly different from the one that we've ended up with? I mean, that fundamental question, was it worth fighting to resist German domination of the European continent, doesn't seem to be facetious at all. It seems to me highly relevant today. Let's think a little bit more about these issues of why the war lasts so long. After all, we're actually rather accustomed uh, to wars ending via negotiation, and, and, that, and that doesn't happen in, in this case. This war ends because one side collapses. Are there any, any thoughts over here about the, the duration of the war? I'm particularly interested to hear from men in the age group that, f that fought, which I think you definitely are in the right age group, so you wouldn't have been um, able to dodge, you dodge the point draft. about um, soldiers having a, a lust for revenge, which kept them fighting possibly until the last man was standing. And then famously in 1914, didn't the Germans and the British forces have a football match? That and is then true. exchange gifts. I was just wondering, where, where was the turning point? like where the war became serious and these these soldiers actually wanted to fight un until the end. This is a great question because it goes to one of the most famous episodes of the war, one which is sometimes dismissed as, as a, a myth, the idea of a Christmas truce uh, between uh, British and German soldiers. Uh, Christmas of, of 1914. It, it's actually true, it did happen at this early stage in the war. Relations between the two armies were sufficiently good that they actually fraternized in no man's land. And although there were still some snipers taking pot shots, it was a pretty dangerous thing to go and celebrate Christmas in no man's land. I don't recommend it if you ever find yourself in that situation. It didn't happen again. And maybe this is a good opportunity just to switch back to one of the experts, Heather Jones, uh, because Heather's done some important work on this precise question of why relations between the two sides at the front deteriorated. Is, is it right, as I, I try to argue, that they go from potential fraternization to, to hatred? And is that one of the reasons that men keep, keep fighting? Hello, Jones. Well, I think there's many reasons why men keep fighting. Uh, one of which is small group camaraderie, uh, the sim simple fact of fighting for the man beside you. Um, another reason is a sense that actually uh, th there's a need for vengeance, as you said. I would agree with that point, that if one has been in battle and, and seen friends killed beside you, it, it gives an impetus to continue fighting. Uh, the other thing is simply by 1916, it is a different war. It is a different type of battlefield. It's industrialized. Uh, many of the men are actually killed at long distance by artillery shells. They don't actually see those who kill them. So a lot of the killing is actually anonymous in the First World War. You don't actually have to have extreme enmity for your enemy to, 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 to 
simply participate. You simply are in a trench being shelled from above. So there's a number of factors, and I would, I would argue it's an interactive process. Ga them. Gary Sheffield, why do men keep fighting? I would like some light to add to that. I spent a lot of time going through letters, contemporary letters and diaries, trying to understand what maintained British troops' morale and motivation. And the simple fact is a lot of them looked at the devastation in Belgium and France and saying, we're fighting, so that does not happen at home. David Reynolds, uh, let me come back to you for a, for a moment. Uh, when I try to imagine alternate endings to World War I, uh, one of the questions in my mind is, is whether it reaches a point when negotiation, when diplomacy is no longer possible because there's just too much damage being done because the body count is just too high. Do you think that's true? And does that tell us something important about, about the nature of, of war and diplomacy? Can, can you reach the point when negotiation is no longer an option? Uh, I, I think you can, probably. Um, for example, Lord Lansdowne, uh, who had been a former foreign secretary, in 1916, first privately and then in public, raises the question, is the body count, as we would now put it, worth carrying on this war for? Uh, ha have we gone too far? Um, and Lansdowne's question is pushed on one side because I think it's almost politically impossible to say, okay, uh, we'll now call it a draw. We've had so many thousands, hundreds of thousands of people killed, but we'll, we'll call it a draw. So that there is a point at which I think diplomacy ceases to be a, a, an option. It's not clear how the war is going to end until really quite late in the day. The Germans still have, at least in their own minds, a realistic chance of winning. In the end, the United States has to intervene and become a combatant power. Kathy, why do you think it was impossible to, to end the war by negotiation once it was clear that neither side could win easily? Well, the thing is, what could America do to stop the war? The U.S. isn't threatened. She only comes into the war not to save the world, but because she's torpedoed into it. I myself don't think she would have joined the war if she hadn't been torpedoed into it, no matter what Wilson wanted. Wilson but just to be clear, it's the, the Germans sinking of American ships using their, their submarines that's decisive in, in bringing the United States into the war? Yes, I think so. It, it, I mean, Wilson won his election in 1916 by saying he was the man who kept us out of war and so forth. But once the U.S. is in the war, the U.S. is the rising power. It hasn't been killing and being killed for the previous three years. It has a massive industrial uh, machine, thanks to all the goods it's been doing. It has the money. All the others are running out of money, and it has an endless supply of Idaho farm boys. It provides morale, as well as manpower, money, and armaments. And so therefore, when you're in that sort of position, Wilson says, now that they're financially in our hands, they'll have to do what we want to do. I was going to go to Gary Sheffield at this point and say, what do you think the American role was, not only in terms of the, the diplomacy, but perhaps more importantly in terms of the fighting in the final phase of the war. Was it decisive? On the United States' uh, contribution to victory, I'd agree with Cathy. I think actually their morale impact is, is huge, both in boosting British and French morale and depressing that of the Germans, who suddenly realise there's a couple of million men coming in the field. That's, that's, that's too many to, to quote a German soldier at the time. The war came to an end when the British Army, and you put the stress on the British Army, raised its effectiveness and was able to match the Germans and overmatch them at their own game. Now I think what should be clear from the way the discussion is going is that you need to see that in the context of American intervention. And in particular, what you need to bear in mind is that sure the British Army became more effective, most of that effectiveness was already there by 1917, it was being matched by increases in German army effectiveness, so in effect if you look at the Battle of Ypres, Third Battle of Ypres in 1917, the British Army was probably doing more damage to itself than it was to the Germans. 
complete change by August 1918 and what's happened in the middle, which you mentioned, is the Ludendorff offensives in which the German army essentially wears itself out and the morale in German army is actually cracking well before August 1918 because of those offensives. But why were those offensives launched? Because of the German fear of American troops arriving en masse in the autumn of 1918 and therefore the Germans not just staying on the defensive but going on to the attack. That's where American intervention is crucial, plus the financial factors that have been mentioned, plus shipping, plus navy. Without the American intervention, I think the best outcome one can see for the Allies is probably some kind of unfavorable draw in the autumn of 1917. Yes, the British Ramis plays a part in the August 1918, but only as part of a much larger coalition effort. Heather Jones, do you buy that argument that in fact it is the home front that's decisive in the sense that the German home front is, is, is hungry, if not actually starving? How, how big a part did that play in the ultimate German collapse? Actually, what's striking is how long the German hold, home front holds out despite the blockade shortages in 1918. We know that there's hunger and there's real difficulties on the, on the home front in the spring of 1918, but with the hope of victory that they have through the Ludendorff offensive, they're prepared to hold out. It's only when the, the news comes in October and it's a shock to the German population because of censorship, when they suddenly find out the extent to which their armies are being pushed back in France, that their morale crumbles. So the army defeat comes first. And I'd really like to emphasize here the French. The initial rise in surrenders in 1918 from, by German soldiers is actually General Mangin's offensive at the end of July 1918 by the French. Amiens is the second strike. Going together, they pummel the German army back. It's not the case simply of the British doing it alone. And I think that's very important to, to really highlight that there. David Reynolds. There is a real debate in the autumn of 1918 about whether to, to uh, go for an armistice with the Germans, to allow them to accept that, or whether to push on in, as, as Foch, for example, the French uh, uh, marshal would want to do, push on into, into Germany. And that's the question where the, the, the issue is being weighed up against a clear-cut victory in which the Germans are seen to be defeated on their own soil against the extra tens of thousands of men that would die if we did that, um, uh, and how would we justify that at home? We know from military historians that they very much had lost, and that that's exactly why they sought uh, an armistice, Heather Jones. Ludendorff and Hindenburg realized the war is lost militarily, so they turned to the civilian politicians uh, from, from, from the more liberal parties in the Reichstag who've wanted democratic reforms in the Kaiserreich for, for a long period of time, and who in fact supported the war only as a, a way of getting leverage to get those reforms, and they turned to the civilian politicians and say, you take charge now, you will negotiate the peace with the Americans, who Germany believes would be more favorable to them than the, the British and French, and therefore the civilians will carry the blame for suing for peace. And that's effectively what happens. It, it's masterminded really very cleverly uh, by, by Hindenburg and Ludendorff. David Stevenson wants to jump in at this well, point. Yeah, David. The thing that makes all this possible is the German High Command's acceptance that military victory, either by offensive or defensive means, is now out of the question. And that brings us back to the other factors we were looking for, looking at earlier on in this discussion about why the German army is essentially crumbling in the summer of 1918, yeah, which is partly for the reasons you outlined, British military achievement, but also American and French contributions to that are indispensable, which is partly why the war had to be ended in a compromise. This is maybe the right opportunity to shift our discussion to the consequences of the war. We think about the law of unintended consequences, which is probably the only law of history that I've ever recognized. It's extraordinary in the way that it operates here. N nobody in 1914 really sets out to blow up the Austro-Hungarian Empire, to blow up the Ottoman Empire. Nobody really sets out to drastically alter the nature of political systems all over Europe, including Germany and Russia, and yet that's the, the end station, a fundamental redrawing of the European map. 
I wanted to go to Simon Winder, who's written uh, uh, a, a delightful book on the history of the, the Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire. Did its collapse, its disintegration into different national component parts, represent a good outcome from the point of view, say, of the British who, who had perhaps not intended that outcome? Well, I think it's one of the key catastrophes which really sows the Second World War. You can see the Second World War looming from this, you know, that, that once you have the central, center of Europe broken into small pieces, given, as you said earlier on, that these are not rational states. And you can just see this horrible rubble forming across Europe, which really negates the whole nature of the victory of the First World War. The Allies don't really win because they've simply created such a pressure cooker over these four years that the centre of Europe breaks into pieces, and those pieces effectively feed straight into Hitler's fantasies, and they feed into communist fantasies, and, and a kind of horrible micro-nationalism, which is way outside Britain's control. This is a moment to go to the audience and see if there are any Leninists uh, who want to agree with me that this is ultimately an imperialistic war, a war that's to be understood in terms of empires rather than, I don't know, the rights of plucky little Belgium. Uh, there's uh, a, a young man there who wants to make a contribution. Yes, please. Um, what I'd like to know is just where would Britain be today had the war not happened, had it gone differently, had the Entente had a more sort of decisive victory and would the empire still exist today or how long would it have taken after 1918 for the empire to disintegrate? Well, like any counterfactual question, we, we can only really guess. But it seems to me the right kind of question to ask, given that by intervening in 1914 in the way that it did, Britain ensured that it paid a very, very heavy cost, not only in terms of lives, but, but financially too. And my position would be that at the end of it all, uh, by the time you get to the armistice in November 1918, the British Empire may be bigger, it ends up being bigger on paper because it acquires territory from its defeated rivals, but it's much weaker. Because if nothing else, it's lost uh, an extraordinary number of skilled young men, and perhaps more importantly, it saddled itself with an absolutely massive debt that makes it very difficult for Britain subsequently to deal with the return of the German challenge. So, so my answer to that question is, in, in many ways, that by intervening in 1914, the British Empire ends up hurting itself more than it strengthens itself. Now, I'm absolutely sure there are members of the panel who will take a very different view. Maybe we should just think about it in terms of imperial interest. Gary Sheffield, is the British Empire strengthened or weakened by its intervention in 1914, do you think? Well, I agree with you. I think, though it's bigger on paper, it is the long term weakened. There's a, a debate in Australia and New Zealand at the moment about whether they were uh, right to intervene what's sometimes seen as somebody else's war. Trouble is, that is not how Australians and New Zealanders thought of themselves in 1914. There is a clear uh, emotional link to the home country. But even on a really basic strategic level, Australia's security was dependent on the Royal Navy. If Britain is defeated, if the Royal Navy is defeated, Australia is then vulnerable. I'm really glad you brought up Australia. I think to have this discussion and not mention it would have got us all into deep trouble. Uh, one of the films that has had an absolutely massive impact on public consciousness about the First World War has been Gallipoli. Um, and you have to find yourself asking the question, why are the Australians uh, in Gallipoli fighting the Turks? Sean McMeekin, you, you have an answer to that question. It's certainly not in the interests of the British Empire in any obvious way. No, it was to win Constantinople and the Straits for the Russians. Well, it's quite simple if you actually look at the diplomatic documents. Obviously, this wasn't explained to the men who were waiting ashore in the trenches and, and dying in great numbers and so on. But if you actually look at what was literally being negotiated in early March 1915, that's what the campaign was about. So in diplomatic terms, it's obvious. It was to win Constantinople and the Straits for Russia. And I must say, I hadn't realized until I read your book that Mel Gibson had been fighting for the Tsar. Uh, that, that, came, that came as a revelation to me. Uh, now, there's a young man here with a light green shirt who's uh, ready to intervene. 
are there no lessons that we can learn for our contemporary foreign policy oh, from what happened lessons. in 1914? Well, if there are lessons, what, what, sure, what are lessons. they? I mean, if you think of Christopher Clarke's recent work on the sleepwalkers, his message at a recent lecture on this matter was this could happen again, but in the sense that a situation can escalate where there is not absolute knowledge on the part of any actor involved, rather than your argument, which I think, if I interpret correctly, you're almost saying Britain has the power to change a situation either for a good or a bad. And I think you're making the terms and the, uh, the possible outcomes on either side too easy. Well, in Chris Clark's book, he, he makes the argument that the great powers sleepwalk into the war. It's the consequence of bad decisions and, and miscalculation, and that I think he's quite close to my view in the pity of war, that it's a huge mistake and everybody's making it. But isn't there an important lesson for our time there, that you can end up making a very big war by mistake? And I think it's worth maybe in the concluding phase of this discussion just thinking about the wars we've seen in recent times, none of which has produced a world war, thank God, but that doesn't mean it couldn't happen. Is there a sense in which we've learned from the events of 1914 enough not to make those same mistakes again? Or are you inclined to agree with the majority of the panel that in the same kinds of circumstances, Britain would be right to go to war? Cathy, what are the lessons for our time in, in terms of how foreign policy should be made? and when military intervention is justified. Well, there are no great principles, principles on that, but I do think the real difference here between going to war then and now is that we would know a lot more. Uh, the, the benefit, shall we say, of, of the intelligence relationship and signals intelligence and so forth is that belligerents would know a lot more what's going on. The real problem 1914, one of many real problems, is that people didn't know what was happening. You knew in general terms, but British Foreign Office didn't know what was happening in the German Chancellery, for example. Well, it would one be, thing's for sure, the United States knows what's going on in all the chancelleries in the world. Thank you I me. was merely going to contrib contribute that very point, in fact, uh, but the point still remains, I think, is that it's, there would be less uh, blindfolded stumbling into war now than there was then. David Reynolds, could we stumble into a, a great war today or have we enough intelligence to avoid it? Uh, no, I'm not sure that we have enough intelligence, but I think it would be much harder to sustain a great war in the way that happened then if you think of the conflicts we've, we've been through recently with embedded reporters, with soldiers themselves taking their own pictures of a war. Um, the divorce between the home front and the uh, the war front is is much less than it was then. So I think part of what is is fascinating and still problematic about this war, in a way that isn't true of 39-45, is you know your title is the, the pity of war, Owen's uh, Wilfred Owen's phrase, but it's the mystery of war in a way. It's this this question of you know, how could those 37 days develop in the way they did. There's a whole range of structural issues that we as historians study, but there's also these amazing areas of contingency. You've played with those, you've, you know, you've teased us in a sense with your counterfactuals, but the reason you can do it is because this is a war whose ending is still going to be debated for another century, uh, whose, whose beginning is going to be debated for another century, whose ending is going to be debated for another century, and that I think is is, is this, it brings out again this strange mixture of big systemic forces and then contingent decisions, and that's true of almost every conflict that we will get into small scale in the next hundred years as you, well. You, Strawn, if you think about the wars that have happened recently, it's been a striking feature that they haven't escalated. But we can imagine, can't we, situations in which they they could have. Is there a danger that we could see something similar? It starts off small, like Serbia and Austria-Hungary, and then it becomes much larger. Could one see an analogy anywhere in the world in the last 10 or 
or so years where that might have happened? Well, I think you'd be certainly argue the case for possible escalation. You've asked rhetorically several times, you know, what, what is it that, that this, this war tells us and what, how does it appeal to us? And I would say, actually, almost in contradistinction to the gentleman who raised the point about the Second World War, that this war is more powerful for us precisely because of the ambiguity uh, about its causation. Because that has a, has a resonance for us today too. When is it right to go to war? When is it wrong to go to war? Is something that we still wrestle with. I mean, David Stevenson's absolutely central point about Britain being faced with two evils, and which one is it going to go for, which is the lesser evil in the circumstance, is something that should have great power for us today. Because many of the situations which we find ourselves in are exactly that, and that is always the true moral dilemma. If there really were a simple answer not to go to war, then in most cases, of course, war would not happen. Uh, but we confront ourselves far more often with situations where we have to weigh up, particularly when we use humanitarian intervention, for example, as a, as a case for possible, for possible action. Well, maybe that's an appropriate note on which we, we draw this discussion to a conclusion. I, I hope that people in China and Japan are listening to what you're saying, Hugh, because if there's one place in the world I could imagine something escalating from a small conflict to a big one right now, it's probably That's it. in East Asia. Not so much. For the Great War for Civilization. From my vantage point, I must confess, the First World War still looks more like a disastrous civil war within Western civilization. It not only killed more than 10 million people, it also shattered the global economic order and made a mockery of the idea of human progress. History is trying to teach us something important here. It's trying to teach us that big wars can have such small causes that they go unnoticed until the wars begin. That globalization is a complex system that has collapsed once before. That strategic choices are best made before rather than in a crisis and that the costs of bad choices can be truly staggering. You can't learn from history just through pious commemoration. Maybe, just maybe, after a hundred years of rationalization, dare I say denial, it's time for us to make the admission that maybe the Great War was a great mistake. website and join the live debate featuring Neil Ferguson and other contributors. And you can also listen live to Stephen Nolan discussing the pity of war with a panel of historians. That's on BBC Radio 5 Live.